Hello, and welcome to our webcast on what provosts think. This is our webcast on our 2022 survey of college and university chief academic officers or provosts, and we're thrilled to have you with us. I'm Scott Jasek, editor of Inside Higher Ed. I'm joined by my fellow editor, Doug Letterman. Uh, we are going to walk you through this PowerPoint and also take some of your questions uh, in the second half of this presentation. First, some housekeeping. We very much want your questions or comments. Uh, use the Q&A box on your screen uh, and feel free to add any context that you think may help us to answer your question. You're welcome to include your institution if you want or your specific role if you want, but you don't have to. Um, and uh, we're, we only read aloud those questions uh, that we're answering. So if your question isn't uh, answered, uh, you won't see it or hear it um, in, the, in the webcast. Uh, but we very much want your questions. Um, Doug and I will, uh, it, before we uh, answer questions, we also want to get your reactions to all of this. And um, we are recording this webcast uh, for those with hearing disabilities. So now we are ready to start. Um, and as usual, Okay, there's Doug's and my names and email addresses. Feel free to reach out about any issue, uh, regardless of whether we talk about it today. Um, the first, I just wanna talk about the methodology for the survey. Um, there's only one answer per, uh, per, uh, for, per institution. So that way we kept it, it honest. Um, at some institutions, the provost has a different title as the vice president for academic affairs. And then we, you know, we use that, that person as the same. All answers are completely anonymous, but coded for sector. So on some issues, we can tell uh, how many public or private provosts or community college provosts uh, thought in a certain way. Uh, the survey was conducted for us by Hanover Research, and the survey was sponsored by Course Dog, APL Next Ed, Modern Campus, D2L, Interfolio, and the Honor Society of Phi, Phi Kappa Phi. We truly appreciate their support for this, um, but they have no uh, role in the questions themselves. So the, the, uh, the content uh, is courtesy of them, but it's uh, because of us. Um, and the, uh, I'm having some issues here. Okay. So one question we always ask is we ask provosts about the academic health of their institution. We do not define academic health. So this is for the provost to decide what they consider uh, important in the academic health of their institution. 32% um, of provosts said their institution was in excellent academic health. 54% said it was good. 12% said it was fair. And 2% said it was poor. Um, the interesting thing there is those answers are pretty steady uh, from recent years and do not appear to reflect any uh, diminution of academic health because of the pandemic. Uh, right now we are coming out of the pandemic, at least in higher ed, um, and there is not a tremendous sense that the pandemic has hurt the academic health of the institutions, at least not from the provosts. Uh, if we asked the faculty, we'd probably hear something a little different. Um, we also asked the provost to respond to the statement, changes made during the pandemic over the last two years have negatively impacted the academic quality of my institution. And here you do see some disagreement. Strong disagreement with the statement was by 22%, 39% disagreed, but 28% agreed and 12% strongly agreed. Um, this is, you know, at, at many institutions, uh, faculty were cut, especially adjuncts. Um, at many institutions, uh, during the portions of the pandemic, uh, the campus was empty as uh, students all studied remotely. Um, and at many institutions, uh, you know, many would say that that did affect uh, the quality of the academic health of the institution. But on the whole, the provost generally felt it didn't. Uh, and that is interesting. We also ask, and this is uh, the provost 
to respond to the which areas they believe their institutions are very effective at. And here we have a bit of a contradiction. Providing a quality undergraduate education um, is, is something that they are all you know, very sure that, uh, that they can, uh, that they're providing. 65% said that answered yes. 52%, but then the numbers go down for some of the other categories. 52% said they're preparing students for the world of work. 45% said they are very effective at offering undergraduate support services. 39% said that they were very effective at identifying and assessing student outcomes. 31% said, answered that yes, with controlling rising prices for students and families. And 22% said that they were very effective at recruiting and retaining talent, talents on the faculty. The, um, the expectation, I think, is that if you're really uh, you know, great at a quality undergraduate education, I would expect some of these other numbers to be higher, uh, and they're not. Um, and that is something to consider um, I, at the institutions, particularly controlling rising prices. Uh, we surveyed the provost before uh, all of the talk about inflation. So that is probably you know, worse now. Um, and recruiting and retaining talented faculty uh, is an issue that has come up since, um, since, the, uh, since we asked them about uh, the provost. Uh, Doug, would you like to add here? Yeah, I would, that, and welcome to everybody. Um, I, there's not just a disconnect in, in the provost uh, minds in terms of uh, the, some of the comparing some of these answers, but I think there's a, um, I think some of their answers, there's a real disconnect with what everybody else thinks or a lot of people outside the institutions, especially uh, I would say on the uh, preparing students for work um, and controlling rising prices. I mean, we are seeing institutions under pretty intense pressure and, and intensifying questioning about uh, the extent to which uh, graduates uh, are, are prepared for work and, and really ready to, ready to, to, uh, to take, especially a first job, but, but, um, and, and, and have more than have the skills that that employers of all different types want. Uh, and in terms of in the provost, obviously aren't fully responsible for for that or for the prices of their you know how, how whether their their graduates are are leaving with uh, manageable debt, et cetera. But those are two issues on which. Um, and again, the provosts aren't. Uh, over the moon about their response here, but um, but for them to say that they're very effective uh, at doing these things, I think those numbers are probably higher than a lot of people would would suggest. Definitely, um, you'll have to forgive my uh, computer is uh, forcing me to try more than once when I want to advance the slides. Um, on we asked a series of questions about the liberal arts. And here we found that um, the, the, actually, wait, we- Skip the slide. Skip the slide, yes. Yep. Uh, on, on general education, we asked the provost, um, you know, what they thought of general education. 50% of provosts strongly agree that general education is a crucial part of undergraduate education and 40% somewhat agree. But only 2% of provosts strongly agree that students at my college understand the purpose of our general education requirements. 29% agreed somewhat, but 4% strongly agreed and 34% somewhat disagreed. Um, here, I mean, my question is, if you really think that general education is so important, uh, why are you low in the numbers who believe that students understand the purpose of our general education requirements? Students certainly understand that they have to take one course from column A and one course from column B, but that's not really understanding the purpose of general education. Um, and I think the provosts are aware of that. I'm not sure if they wanna do something about it. Um, then we turn to the liberal arts and we asked the provost a series of questions about the liberal arts and uh, the, the future of the liberal arts. 
Um, in terms of the liberal arts is central to undergraduate education, even in professional programs, we had a very high percentage of the provosts who agreed. 47% uh, strongly agreed, another 42% so, uh, somewhat agreed. Um, that's very significant because most of the provosts in our survey are not at liberal arts institutions, and they are responsible for a range of programs, not just the liberal arts. Uh, and then you can see uh, the other answers. The concept of a liberal arts education is not well understood in the United States. 41% agreed and 47, 41% strongly agreed, 47% somewhat agreed. Um, and that is also really important. Uh, you know, in many colleges and universities, um, as uh, budgets got tight, um, liberal arts departments and particularly humanities departments took major cuts. And I'm not arguing about, about those cuts here, but I'd say that to faculty members and others who are upset about those cuts, are you doing something about the fact that most people don't understand the liberal arts and why it's important? Um, my institution is increasing attention on the ability of our degree programs to help students get good jobs. 35% strongly agreed and 52% uh, somewhat agreed. Now, Increasing attention to helping students get good jobs is not counter to the liberal arts, but it's not necessarily it's not necessarily in support of the liberal arts either. And as that is a major focus, um, what will happen to liberal arts? Then this is an, another very important question. I expect to see the number of liberal arts colleges decline significantly over the next five years. We did not define significantly, but let left that to the provost. 16% strongly agreed and 55% somewhat agreed. That is a very striking number uh, in terms of the kinds of uh, closures or mergers that provosts are expecting. Um, and it's you know, very important to think about. Politicians, presidents, and boards are increasingly unsympathetic to liberal arts education. 18% um, strongly agreed, 46% somewhat agreed. Um, you know, that is very uh, much of concern uh, to, uh, you know, frankly, to me and to others because uh, the provost presidents and board, the politicians presidents and boards are making the decisions uh, on what will matter uh, in the years ahead. Um, we also asked them some other questions. High quality undergraduate education requires healthy departments in certain fields of the liberal arts, in English, history, political science, Etc. 34% strongly agreed and 51% uh, somewhat agreed. This is very interesting in light of uh, cuts recently made in the liberal arts uh, to those departments at many institutions. Even at institutions that are keeping those departments, um, are they being adequately supported? Um, many would question that. Politicians and board members are prioritizing STEM and professional programs over those that support liberal general education. 21% strongly agreed and 48% agreed. Again, th this is an attitude problem that the provosts don't control, but is very important to consider um, uh, for the future of the university. The number of students majoring in a program is an appropriate way to determine which departments to cut. Now, there was um, some disagreement, 6% strongly disagreed, 36% somewhat disagreed, but 5% agreed, uh, strongly agreed, and 24% agreed. You know, these, that, that should really concern a lot of people, a lot of the faculty, because this is increasingly how many universities are deciding what to cut um, uh, and that means that many departments uh, that might be small are endangered regardless of the value that they provide to the institution. Um, we asked the provost about their spending priorities. Uh, please indicate your level of agreement with the following statement. I anticipate major allocation of funds to the following categories in the next budget year. Professional and pre-professional programs uh, 14% strongly agreed, 53% somewhat agreed. STEM fields, very similar numbers, 15% strongly agreed, 
uh, 51 percent uh, somewhat agree. Online programs, 13 percent strongly agreed and 47 percent uh, somewhat agreed. And then arts and sciences programs, 4 percent strongly agreed, only 26 percent somewhat agreed. Now, um, in terms of these questions, I realize that a lot of specific programs could fit into more than one category. They could be, you know, STEM and online and in the arts and sciences department. Um, but this was an effort to just sort of see what the provosts are thinking about things. Um, and it should uh, concern, I, I, you know, I think it does raise some issues um, because uh, it suggests the future is not necessarily as bright for arts and sciences as some of those other programs. Um, and one question, or we asked a series, several questions uh, this year about mental health. Mental health has become a huge issue. Uh, it was a huge issue before the pandemic, but it's really been a huge issue during the pandemic. Um, I, as many people have, have had mental health difficulties and many institutions have become aware of them. So we asked what amount of importance does your institution place on supporting faculty and staff mental health? 12% um, said it was extremely important and 37% said it was very important. Moderately important got 36% and not important at all uh, and somewhat important got 15%, not important at all got 1%. Um, that, that is a very split um, uh, decision in terms of, you know, whether they, the, the mental health concerns of faculty uh, and staff are getting serious attention. And I'm not suggesting that the universities in any way uh, take away what they're doing for students, uh, because th there is um, a clear problem for students there. And that's why many institutions are focusing on it. But um, I would question why many institutions aren't necessarily focusing it on others. Uh, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement? My institution has formal plans to address the mental health needs among faculty and staff. 4% said it was extremely important. 33% uh, said it was somewhat important and then the other numbers. So um, this is also something on which uh, the, uh, the people who answered our survey are split. Uh, Doug, did you want to add here? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to offer a little bit of a um, alternative point of view from the presidents, and it's interesting because you could probably make a case uh, that the presidents maybe are more distant from uh, the answer to this question than the provost in certain ways. Um, but we asked presidents in our survey of them in March not exactly similar questions, but sort of related questions. And I would say that in general, the presidents expressed, I mean, we asked a set of questions around how aware the presidents were of the general state of mental health uh, as a, to, for different uh, elements of, of their different constituents. And, and per the point Scott just made, um, the, 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 the much more sort of awareness of, and in some ways concern about uh, the, the mental health status of students, undergraduate students, which is unsurprising in many ways, just because um, they are, uh, uh, and sorry if this makes some of you uncomfortable, but they are the paying customer um, uh, and they have uh, advocates in the, in the uh, form of parents and others who, uh, in, if we're talking about traditional age students at least, uh, who are uh, gonna make sure people hear about it if, if uh, uh, they don't feel the, the students are being taken care of. So, um, so I guess it, it's unsurprising, but I guess I, I didn't, I, I agree with Scott that these questions, the answers to these questions to me don't reflect quite as much awareness of and concern about uh, faculty and staff mental health as I, as I tend to hear when, when we're talking to campus leaders. And so I find those numbers low, uh, lower than I would have expected. But um, the presidents seemed to be a little, to be expressing at least a little more awareness of and concern about um, mental health needs of, of faculty and staff than, than I think the provosts were. Uh, thank you. And so, and mental health, uh, another set of questions on mental health uh, was asking, you know, how would you rate your own level of awareness 
of the general state of mental health as it relates to following members of your community. For faculty, they, they said that they were uh, very, um, you know, very aware of, of uh, 65% said they were very aware, 33% said somewhat, somewhat aware. Staff, 44% very aware, and 52% somewhat aware. Undergraduates, 53 and 43. And then graduate students was interesting to me because there have been many problems um, I, the, with, uh, with, with graduate student mental health has been documented for some time now. Um, and there, the numbers were frankly lower than I would have expected. Only 25% said they were very aware, 42% said somewhat aware. So again, this relates to the issues that, um, you know, th th that come up in terms of, uh, you know, will they, they adopt policies if their level of awareness isn't greater? Um, so we also asked the provost about tenure and its alternatives. Um, on the statement, tenure remains important and viable at my institution, 30% of provosts strongly agreed, and another 30% agreed somewhat. 50% strongly disagreed. So that's, you know, 60% of provosts uh, are answering yes to a question about tenure that they value it and that it's important. But then we asked them another question, um, asked if they favor or oppose a system of long-term contracts over the existing tenure system in higher education, 60% said they favored such a system. So, I mean, I, you look at the two uh, questions together, and I think, you know, provosts are not necessarily going to lead the charge against a tenure, but, um, but they are open to it. And that's really important to, to, to say. While we didn't break down the answers this way, um, I suspect that provosts at more prestigious institutions, which tend to have stronger tenure systems than other institutions, um, were very much uh, in uh, the 40% of the second question. Um, and this again suggests that people who really care about tenure uh, need ha have a lot of work to do um, uh, in terms of getting, uh, getting strong support. Almost three quarters of provosts, 73%, said their institution relies significantly on non-tenure track faculty for instruction. And most important, they don't anticipate that changing. Um, and this, this, again, is no surprise, frankly, to me as I've been watching this, but it is a, um, it, it's really a reflection, I think, of the realities uh, that face colleges and universities that those that, that do rely on non-tenure track faculty um, perceive themselves not to have the money that it would cost to put more of them on the tenure track. Um, they, you know, there's always some, ex some excuses or, you know, that people use uh, that, you know, you don't know if you're going to need a tenure track faculty member to teach some obscure topic, but most adjuncts don't teach obscure topics. Most adjuncts work teaching composition, mathematics, basic things that colleges offer every year. And there's no sense that that is, uh, that, that there's gonna change um, in you know, what they do. So I think adjuncts are going to be with us for some time. Then we also asked a question about graduate student unions. 38% of provosts said that graduate students should be allowed to unionize. Um, and 96% of those who oppose unions say it's because of the principle that graduate students' primary role is as a student and their secondary role is as an employee. Um, and you know, I think that's, that's interesting because it really gives a clear reason why the provosts are not going to necessarily cave on graduate student unions. Now, in many states, um, the provosts have no say on it. No, you know, the, the ultimately um, at a public college, uh, the right to unionize is dictated by a state law or state governing board. Uh, at private colleges, it's governed by the NLRB. So it's not that, that it's dictated by the provost, but the provost can definitely influence the discussion um, and does do so. 
And, um, you know, at Indiana University right now, uh, there are very uh, strong disagreements with what the provosts stand against a graduate student union uh, at, that the faculty wants to have the union rights. Uh, Doug, did you want to add here? Yeah, all I would say is um, the provost may may um, believe that in believe in that principle, and I think there's obviously a a logical um, uh, rationale behind that. I'm not sure that's the way the law is. Uh, a lot of people are looking at it, and uh, you know, if you look around, and again, this is all going to vary. Uh, d depending on the uh, which, uh, especially if we're talking about federal law, which administration is in power, et cetera. But I think right now we are certainly seeing uh, the idea of a, a more expansive view of of who should who can qualify for being in a union, et cetera. I mean, we're we haven't seen this happen fully on the at the college athlete level, but I think there's a, especially with the Democratic administration in power for, for now at least, um, I think you know, the 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 idea, I think in general, I would see the trend moving in the other direction that anybody who's uh, working meaningfully as part of their uh, role is gonna is gonna uh, probably maybe be viewed increasingly as employees rather than students. So it, the provost may be uh, holding on to a, a, an out, a principle that may be increasingly outdated. Um, I, I agree with that. Um, now we're going to switch to your questions. We want, we want your questions on anything in the survey or your suggestions on what, uh, what we should ask next year. Uh, I again want to thank Course Dog, APL Next Ed, Modern Campus. D2L, Interfolio, and the Honor Society of Phi Kappa Phi for supporting this survey. Uh, and now we'll turn to the questions. Doug, is there a first question? Sure, sure. yeah. Uh, um, so um, somebody asked, can you comment on the theme of this article and what two and four year colleges should do about recent graduates' perceptions? And it's, it was a, an article uh, in Forbes recently, and, and there have been many like this the, about sort of college graduates having what, what this article called buyer's remorse um, about sort of whether they felt, and this, this relates to the larger question about whether people feel the increasing questioning that we talked about a little earlier about the value of a, of a degree um, and whether people are prepared for, uh, for the, the workforce and for life. And uh, well, I said before that I think there's um, increased questioning of that, which I think there is. I actually, I, I don't think that colleges suddenly started being terrible at preparing people for work and life. You know, we, we've, colleges have been responsible for, uh, personally responsible for doing that for a long time. Um, and I think, you know, what we have seen is a great expansion in the number of people with college over time, over the last decades, uh, people with college credentials and and a, a great expansion of the number of people flowing into higher education. And anytime you widen that pool, um, you're gonna probably have greater variation in how well prepared people are. But we've also seen changes in the expectations on the employer side um, and people expecting perhaps a sort of moving goalposts in terms of how well prepared college students are. And I do think we're in an era where a lot of employers don't want to necessarily be anybody's first employer. And they want to sort of have maybe overly heightened expectations for what graduates can do, et cetera. So I guess what the way I would answer that question is in terms of the, the way this the, the person who asked this question, what it, comment on the theme of the article. Do I think that there is an increased perception that graduates aren't prepared for the workforce? Yes. Uh, do I think there's a lot of questioning of, of graduates themselves about whether college was worth it? Yes. Um, I think the price of higher education, the fact that many more people are taking out debt and that the debt is rising, et cetera, is significantly responsible for that. You're going to have higher expectations for what you get and, and maybe judge it differently um, the more you pay for it, I think. Um, but I, do, I don't necessarily think that that means that colleges are doing a bad job uh, 
educating and uh, people for what come what's ahead. What I, so in terms of what colleges should do about it and, and changing graduates' perceptions, um, I mean, I do think there are some things that institutions should be doing that would improve the preparation of their <clears throat> uh, students and graduates for work. I think more institutions should be embedding into the curriculum actual skills that people are going to use in the workforce. And, and I think institutions already do a quite a, a, quite a good job with, with many of the sort of um, uh, sort of higher order skills. I do think there's um, people are institutions, a lot of institutions prepare well, people well to think critically, et cetera. What I don't think they do on that side of things, on the higher order skills, is necessarily help graduates understand what they're learning. And so some of it is about the translation. Some of it is about in making sure uh, that, that a student in a particular course knows what outcomes the course is, is striving to produce for the students. Uh, it's going to help you become a, a communicate in these ways. It's going to help you uh, think critically in these ways. And I think there's been a lot of movement in that direction of late. What I think the other thing that institutions can do, so some of it's about translation and making students aware of what they're getting from a course and from a program of study. The other is actually embedding more, somewhat more practical skills into the curriculum. And I'm not talking about having a separate course on using Excel, but making sure that assignments have students working in teams, which is one of the skills that employers really want to see. Uh, having uh, students do certain things that they're going to end up doing in the workplace, writing in certain kinds of ways. So I do think there's a lot of work that can be done on the curricular side to both both improve the preparation of students for what come, what's ahead and graduates' understanding of what they have already gained. Um, I've got two questions that sort of relate. Um, any thoughts on the following at my institution? undergraduates really disliked classes on Zoom, but graduate students loved it and the flexibility. So what might provosts think of it this going forward? There's another question asking about the future of online education. So first of all, um, it's very important not to assume that uh, when students took online courses that were online only because uh, they couldn't go to campus, particularly in that first semester, that that's real online education. It was more like remote emergency education uh, for, for the students. Um, and you know, it was great what colleges pulled together quickly, but it wasn't really good high quality online education because it wasn't planned as online education. But that attitude uh, very much uh, is similar to what we are hearing generally and also what we're seeing in trends in online enrollments. Um, generally, we are seeing much more interest in enrollment uh, online from uh, graduate students because they value the, the, the flexibility. They value, the, you know, they, they, are, they are older than undergrads and they, um, you know, they know why they're there. Uh, you know, you don't get a master's degree or a PhD or law degree or medical degree just because you, you get it for a reason. Um, and while they, they too value in-person instruction, um, and I, I think with, with them, the, the big growth area will be hybrid programs that have some of both, um, they are much more able to make the choices that will make them good online students. Undergraduates, and, and here I'm going to generalize, and so please forgive me if you are an undergraduate uh, listening or uh, relate to undergraduates. Undergraduates are not as uh, are not as mature, don't have as much experience. Um, may in many cases, uh, undergraduates are uh, people are are not necessarily rich. They may not have a place to study that is quiet, um, and there are all kinds of reasons for them why um, the undergraduate experience, uh, they don't, why they don't want to be online. And a big part of it is also uh, undergraduate education also includes a lot that's not in the classroom. Um, students get to know one another, get to do things together, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and that isn't going to take place as much online. So, you know, I think when we look at the enrollment, it's not that I think undergraduate enrollment online is going to disappear. It definitely has a market. Um, uh, and in, in certain areas, it's going to be quite popular. But I suspect we're going to see mo a higher rate of growth in graduate education. And, and that I think provosts will have to deal with that because it's very important that they get the faculty who may be able to teach an undergraduate in person and graduate students online and to really teach graduate students online, not just to move their move a, a lecture course online. Uh, Doug? Yeah, I, I want to just add a quick couple things on that. Um, I'll, I'll put an even finer point on it. Uh, uh, most undergraduates at least those who are who were who had chosen to study in person before um, d didn't like what they got and it's not surprising none of the courses that institutions pivoted to were built to to be online and the students weren't studying online by choice over time um, I, uh, the person who asked that initial question followed up to say undergrads still disliked Zoom in the following semesters when faculty had more experience with it. But I would say on balance, despite all the work that institutions did um, to sort of train faculty, true online courses are built from the beginning to be online and to, to, to enable significant um, interaction between instructors and students and, and among students. And they're built to embed active learning uh, in, in, you know, in online settings. Um, and so you know, a, there was actually more lecturing, I suspect, um, in, the, in, in the pandemic era remote learning than you know, we've seen a, a, a reasonable beginning, of, at least, of transition away from the lecture as the primary or especially sole form of, of an active learning is what students want kind of period. And finding ways to do that in, per, in online as well as in person takes a ton of work. And I think a lot of instructors um, not as, who, who didn't set out to be online teachers still haven't necessarily undertaken the work of the hard work of, of turning courses into really strong, virtually delivered courses. Um, so anyway, um, I want to shift a little bit. Somebody asked, do you think if colleges and universities don't change as the higher education uh, market evolves, that more for-profit higher education online institutions, such as Walden University, University of Phoenix, and Capella University, will begin to increasingly dominate the market? Um, no, I don't. I think I think um, I think we may. First of all, I, I agree with Scott. For undergraduate education, I do not believe that fully online is likely to become the dominant way of delivering. I think what we're seeing, what we've started to see, and what I think we'll continue to see, is much more work at blending elements of instruction instructional delivery. Um, Scott was right to separate the graduate from the undergraduate. Graduate education and place-bound people, people who do not want to be residential, that number is growing. And I do think we will see more and more, I mean, we're seeing the number of re potential residential students shrink. Um, we lost a couple of mil we lost more than a million students in the last couple of years, some of whom were residential, some of whom were not, but the demographic uh, decline that awaits is among those likeliest to be residential students, the 18 to 22 year olds. Um, and so institutions by almost by design are gonna be dealing more and more if they're gonna survive with older students and others who need to be, who are likeliest to need or demand the flexibility of being able to study. But the for-profits, they're not disappearing, but their days are, um, their, their heyday has passed. First of all, there are far fewer of them than there used to be. Many of them are transitioning to become nonprofits. Um, there, are, there is a lot of growth in fully online nonprofit institutions like Southern New Hampshire University and Western Governors University that have pivoted well to serve adults. 
those may eat the lunch of institutions that don't change, but I don't think it's gonna be a really about the for-profits. Um, here's another question on online education. Online education is more cost-effective for higher ed institutions in the long run. Do you see more traditional colleges and universities moving toward online courses, especially graduate programs? Well, definitely they're moving for graduate programs, but I wanna push back a little bit on the assumption in the first sentence that online education is more cost-effective for higher ed institutions. Um, online education can be more cost-effective if you are just you know, uh, putting on somebody's video of their lectures, but good online education requires student interaction with faculty members. Those faculty members may not have PhDs, they might have PhDs. They may be uh, different kinds of, ha have different kinds of backgrounds, but there is a fundamental desire by students to it truly interact with their faculty online and in person. And, and so I think that, that the, 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 the assumption is largely based on colleges ignoring uh, or, or would be based on colleges ignoring that reality. And so I think that the, um, the savings that colleges get um, are much smaller than, uh, than assumed. Now, will some colleges move ahead anyway and make these cuts? Of course, um, but I don't think those are the online programs that will truly succeed um, with today's students. Doug? Yeah, um, this is a, 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 a a question that that sort of uh, uh, asks whether the provosts are living on the moon. Um, how do you square these rosy answers? 86% good to excellent academic health, 61% pandemic has had no negative effect, 65% very effective quality undergraduate education with five semesters of declining enrollment and a weighted national first time on time grad rate dropout rate of 50%. If quality is so high, why are outcomes so middling and students stopping out slash not enrolling? Do provosts believe the causes are outside of their control? I think there's, I think there's more we can do. So there's a lot in there, obviously. Um, listen, there are a ton of factors, a ton of reasons why uh, enrollments are falling uh, over, over the last five, five semesters. And actually it's a longer period than that if you, if you go all the way back. Um, and yes, it's true that, that there is, uh, you know, we still have a, a, a pretty surprising uh, comparatively small proportion of, of uh, people who enroll in higher education completing. Um, I think don't, and I, and I do believe uh, that I think the, there's a tendency of a lot of leaders in higher ed to have overly rosy perceptions of, um, of their situations. I, I felt that way about our president's survey a couple months ago. And I, I think the provost also, um, aren't necessarily seeing and acknowledging uh, some of the, the, the warning signs. Um, but I, I think there's, um, and I, I think there is a lot that institutions need to do, and I tried to talk about that. Um, I, think, I think though, I guess I'm not 100% sure that, I think there are a lot of reasons why enrollments are falling that don't have much to do with, um, with the quality of what institutions are doing. There's a huge number of factors uh, that affect, but I think, listen, higher education is under pressure as it's never been um, to prove its value and to prove uh, that the outcomes are, are strong. And I think there's a ton of work to do. And I think there is a lot that institutions can do to improve um, improve what they do and to, and to help graduates uh, and, and non-graduates become graduates and help graduates uh, succeed more. So I don't disagree with the questioner's uh, pre premise. And I do think that um, campus leaders, I, I do worry that if campus leaders think things are great, they won't necessarily undertake the hard work to uh, to, to make the changes that are necessary. Uh, I very much agree. Uh, what do you make of the dichotomy in terms of recognizing the importance of liberal arts education, but anticipating a decline over the next five years? 
what are the ways liberal arts can attract more students or improve their value proposition? So I think that, you know, the, the reason they are answering that way um, is they are, they are smart people looking at what's going on. Um, you know, there's a section of liberal arts colleges, uh, your Williams, Amherst, Swarthmore, uh, Pomona, that are doing quite well and will continue to do quite well. Um, but you go much below that and, um, and the liberal arts college is in trouble. Many colleges that call themselves liberal arts colleges um, aren't liberal arts colleges in terms of, you know, you can't really be a liberal arts college and have your top major be business. That doesn't mean business is a bad major, but it's just not a liberal arts college, uh, even though uh, some liberal arts colleges uh, are somewhat slow to, uh, to make that point. Um, the colleges that are successful, that have attracted more students, have been very rigorous about it and have gone about it department by department and also recognizing that what people most value about a liberal arts education may not in fact be the liberal arts. So there was a book that we wrote about uh, several years ago uh, that tried to, to analyze what were measures of success uh, for alumni five, 10 and 30 years after graduation. And graduates of liberal arts colleges did much better than others because they had the team skills Doug was talking about. They could speak, uh, they could write well, they, they interacted with groups. Um, and a more, a, a more recent example would be from Wake Forest University, which is not a liberal arts college, but which in its liberal arts disciplines and I think it's other disciplines, each department uh, requires, uh, is required to track down their graduates and their recent graduates and find out what they're doing. And then to share that information, not with names because of FERPA, of course, but share that information uh, with the students. And what they are finding out is that art history majors aren't necessarily all going into art history. There's a tremendous um, ignorance, frankly, in the public about what it means to be a history major, which I was. Um, you know, the, and I use my, my knowledge of history, but I'm not doing history work every day. Um, and I think it's gonna really require that. Now, in terms of the number of liberal arts colleges declining, um, I, think, I think they will decline over the next five years. I'm not sure by what percentage. I'm not sure if that's gonna be terrible to liberal arts colleges, because I think there will be more of an alignment between the supply and demand, frankly, and that those that, that remain are gonna, are gonna be those that have a strong sense of what they are and why they are. Uh, Doug? Yeah, I, I would just add a couple thoughts on, on this. I mean, I, uh, I'm probably less, there, there's a difference between the liberal arts disciplines and a liberal arts departments, and um, and the traits that and skills and outcomes that one associates with um, with the with the disciplines, and I think uh, why students are I, I I think there are good and bad reasons why we we're seeing students and to a large extent parents push students into not into sort of what uh, disciplines that appear to be more practical and that's but it's mostly around um it's it's some of what scott said about sort of understanding what graduates of specific disciplines go on to do uh to go on to do but it's also uh, going back to what i said before i think the typical graduate of a, of a liberal arts uh, discipline doesn't, hasn't been told and shown, not shown and, and, and made aware of, given the language to, to, to describe to an employer um, what he or she has learned and what, what the work that they've done has made them capable of doing. Because when you look at what employers are really looking for, 
yes, they do want somebody to walk in and be able to um, do make use a pivot table in 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 Microsoft Excel and you know maybe do a little bit of coding or whatever. And so some of them are really are, are sort of practical skills, but a lot of it is to again work in teams. Um, be able to connect dots in in and analyze and to be able to absorb information then and explain it back in a simpler, clearer way. You know, those are the those are the skills that one that a strong liberal arts uh, curriculum. And again, whether it's in a major that is a traditional liberal arts major. Again, I don't want to get the historians and English folks all up in arms, but the skills that the, 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 lear the type of learning can happen in lots of different ways. And we should be embedding liberal arts um, approaches and liberal arts uh, uh, work designed to develop the liberal arts skills in all sorts of disciplines. So I don't know, I, I'm, I, it's not that I'm not worried about it, but I, A, this is a crisis of 40 or 50 years and not, not now. Um, and B, I think, it, so I, I do think a lot of it is about um, being much more purposeful about explaining and, 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 and embedding into the curriculum um, the, the, the sort of understanding of what students are gaining. Um, okay, um, one uh, other question. I, we have time for many universities rely on tuition dollars from international students their enrollment has declined. How do you think this will play out over time given the discussion regarding preparation for jobs, online education, et cetera? I think this is one of the key questions uh, that we have in terms of, uh, of you know, what is going to happen with the pandemic. Many people want the pandemic to be over. Obviously, everyone wants the pandemic to be over, but it may not be over. Um, and, and, you know, and in terms of people who are confident that it's going to be over, um, they're, they're, you know, they are, hopefully they're right, but they're probably fooling themselves. Look at the spread of, of, of this virus. Um, we have no idea where it's going to pop up next or with what, uh, variation, uh, or et cetera. Um, and the visas, it's one thing that, you know, there are definitely students who want to come to the United States. A lot of students want to come to the United States, um, but um, it's unclear that we are going to let them in uh, or let them in in the same numbers that they were enrolled prior to the pandemic. Um, and, and that is a huge tuition question um, as this, this uh, questioner knows. Um, and so I think uh, many colleges and universities are going to be disappointed this fall uh, in the number of, of, uh, of students that will, they'll get from abroad, or they will have to focus on specific groups of international students, those who are already in the United States, rather than their general uh, approach. Um, and so I, I think it's going to be very tricky. Uh, and now there'll still be lots of international students, but in terms of their numbers, uh, I think it's going to be very tricky. Um, I think that's all the time we have today for questions. I want to thank the sponsors, Course Dog, APLU, APL Next Ed, Modern Campus, D2L, Interfolio, the Honor Society, of Phi Kappa Phi, and thank all of you for listening this afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye.